Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, um, I'm Ruby. I'm an alcoholic. at a meeting before. I am 16 years old. I have seven months clean. Um, um, I'm in between sponsors right now, but I'm, I have worked the steps. I go to meetings every day. I have commitments. I'm working on getting involved in H&I. Um, I guess I'll start. My childhood is pretty good for the most part. I mean, I don't want to go into that, but... I started using when I moved in with my dad when I was 12. My cousin there smoked a bunch of weed. I was super depressed from running away from home from my mom. And one day we were on the bus home from school, and she was like, you know, I smoke weed, and if you ever want to, like, you can with me. Like, no peer pressure at all. And immediately I was like, fuck yes, I want to smoke weed with you. And then every day we would, um, our parents would never be home. So at 5 in the morning we'd wake up, smoke weed, take the two-hour bus ride to school, come home and smoke weed, and that was, like, my schedule. Every day in seventh grade. He lived on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. The farm got sold. We had to move to Oakland. Um, eighth grade, I um, I didn't really do anything. I didn't know where I would get anything. If I had a connection, I would have gone to it, but I didn't. I started hanging out with, like, the only kids that would smoke weed at my middle school, which were not a lot of them. So I didn't really do anything in eighth grade. But then ninth grade... Um, for the first time, I had a really solid group of friends. They were all pieces of shit, but I mean, <laughs> they were still my friends. They were really popular kids, and I was like, this is fucking cool, because I've never had, like, a group of friends that, like, accepted me because I was always, like, poor, or my family was weird, your mom's crazy, your dad's also crazy. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> So hung out with them for a while. Two months into high school, I started dating this kid for the pure reason to like be me. And I started dating him just so I could hurt him. And that was like the only reason that I dated him. And I broke up with him after like a month. And then, <laughs> and then him and this other boy thought it'd be really funny if they told a bunch of people that I like gave them head inside a movie theater. And then all my friends were like, it obviously happened if they said it did. And everyone was like, if you're the only one denying that rumor, then it must be true. I'm like, you guys are fucking stupid. And one thing led to another. And like, it got to the point where everyone I was like, was saying she's getting like double teamed in the H building bathroom. And like, she let the whole football team run a train on her when I like hadn't even had my first kiss yet. And I lost everyone. Like, I didn't hang out with anyone. I just hung out at home. I mean, it was fine. It sucked, but, I mean, it was fine for a while. People would say slut, and I'm like, I don't fucking care or whatever. Even if I was doing all that, it's none of your business. But then I started kicking it with this girl, Rosalie, who no one else liked because she smoked meth and, like, did hella drugs. And started hanging out with her all the time. We started smoking weed every day, and we'd take, like, shitty raver kid drugs and, like, not go to class. And we thought it was really cool, and it wasn't. And, um, so started smoking a lot of weed and got arrested outside my school. My dad figured out for the first time that I was smoking weed, shadowed me in class. That was great. Um, <laughs> and then <laughs> after that, I, um, after those three days of going to school, I would just continuously miss more and more class just to ditch and go to my friend's house and get high and do whatever drugs he had. Eventually, me and this girl, um, me and my best friend, we kind of just, like, stopped going to class all together. Like, we go to her first period, walk the track, and then ditch and go to our friend's house and just smoke weed. And then we started hanging out with these sketchy seniors that did a lot of coke and um, sold a lot of painkillers, and we got really into that. And that's when, like, everything went downhill really fast. Like, I did not have a lot of time to fuck up, but... 
when I started to, it went down. Like, I stopped going to school. I went from smoking weed and, like, taking ecstasy and shrooms to, like, doing cocaine and taking Oxycontin with a bunch of freshman kids when I was 14. And I don't know. Like, my parents knew that I was smoking weed. They didn't really know what else. Like, they put me in therapy, and i tell my therapist, who is a recovering addict every day, I'd be like, it's okay. I can do it by myself. I promise I'll start going to school. I promise that I'll stop. Like, just tomorrow. Like, tomorrow. Every time that I would see her. And I kept telling my parents that, and they drug tested me. And I'm like, I was like, yeah, there's going to be drugs in my system. Like, I've been smoking weed. And... <laughs> That was the worst mental state I've ever been in. I looked like shit. I was really skinny. There was not a time I wasn't high. And my mind state was, like, if I'm not high, like, I'm probably going to kill myself or someone else because there's no point for me to live without being high. Like, I'm going to die high. And then my parents let me fuck up for a while, and then I got sent to wilderness camp. And they still didn't know I was doing drugs to their minds. Like, I was just smoking weed and drinking or whatever. And I lied. I bullshitted it through the wilderness camp, came home, stayed sober for a month, and then got fucked up at my brother's friend's graduation party. Smoked weed and got super drunk. Um, almost got raped by my brother's 21-year-old friend. Um, but a nine-year-old family friend, like, saved me from that. And that I thought that that would be a wake-up call for me, but it wasn't. For the next three weeks that I was visiting. I was just getting drunk and high the whole time. I um, learned how to detox, so my um, piss test would be clean for when I came home. I passed a test. Two days later, I came home hella stoned. My dad tested me, and I got grounded, but that did not stop me. Um, I started dating this kid, got into, like, the worst relationship I possibly could have. He's a really bad alcoholic and a total piece of shit. And, yeah, any possible type of way that you can, like, abuse someone or harm someone, like, he did that to me. Like, he tore apart my confidence, fucking ruined my life. I didn't have any friends. Like, all my friends were his friends. Every day I was at his house, and that's why I was so scared to break up with him was because I felt like I didn't have anywhere to go. Like, I'm not going to have any friends because I can't hang out with any of them anymore. Like, I cut everyone else off. I'm not going to have anything, so... I just smoked weed for a while after wilderness camp, and then when things got super fucked up with that kid, I started doing a bunch of drugs again. Not to the extent that I did before, but it got pretty bad again. Finally broke up with him after his mom talked to me on the phone for three hours about how I needed to leave him, and... I know when, when your boyfriend's mom is like telling you that they need to like break up with your son then like you probably should and that's why I did and um, that was the, the best decision I ever made while I was using the only good decision I ever made when I was using and then I mean I found friends I found a bunch of stoners like they were taking like stupid raver kid drugs and then I started hanging out with this um drug dealer who used to sell drugs in Richmond this girl that was in the um same grade as me and she would always give me pills like she would just like rifle through her bag and like dump shit out and we just take it like we would just like go on like pill identifier and like take it and I'm like I don't even care what it is but Yes, I couldn't even, at that point, I was in independent studies, and I couldn't even make that happen. Like, I couldn't go to school for two hours a week and, like, do the two hours of homework that I would usually just copy off of the internet. I couldn't even make that happen. My parents put me in CDRP, and I stayed sober for eight days, and then I got super drunk, and my friends had weed, and I was like, let's smoke. And then it just, I just kept smoking, didn't care, was detoxing sometimes, and then when I couldn't, I just would get someone else's piss, started doing a bunch of drugs again, didn't care, my parents still didn't know, they still didn't know, they thought I was just smoking weed, because I would get someone else's pee, because I knew it had to have, like, THC in it in the test, but I didn't want all these other, like, opiates and, like, fucked up shit showing up, and then... Um, I lasted about five months in CDRP before I was like, mom, dad, like this obviously, this obviously isn't working. Like we need to get me out of this program because I'm not staying sober. And really, I just didn't want to have to worry about passing my drug test. I just wanted to keep fucking up without getting tested. And they were like, well, maybe we should think about sending you to rehab. And I was like, fuck, well, it's okay because that's hella expensive and they do not have money for that. And they talked to my CDRP counselor about it and she got in touch with, um, the camp recovery center, which is the place where a lot of um, young people go. It's an adolescent and adult rehab. 
And they got in touch, and it was like, I was like, it's probably not going to happen. And then she drove to my dad, and she was like, so your insurance is going to cover all of it, so there's no copay. And I was like, awesome, great. And then <laughs> she was like, so in two weeks, you're going to rehab. And those two weeks were fucking crazy. I didn't sleep. I didn't do anything. I mean, besides drugs, we just... <laughs> <laughs> drunk than I'd ever gotten in that entire two weeks in my life, did more coke, took more painkillers, smoked more weed than like in the past three years that I had used, and then went to rehab, and that place is fucking amazing, like I still hang out with some of the girls in rehab, and I went there for two months, and the whole time I was super unsure about it, finally came clean to my parents about all the drugs that I was doing, got charges dropped against me because of my um, therapist there, which is really cool. And I made a lot of friends there, and a lot of them lived in the Bay Area, so I was like, you know, like, let's see how long I can keep this going. Like, I'm coming out of here with 60 days. Like, let's see what if I can keep this going. Like, let's see if I can keep do it, doing it. And I did. I stayed sober after rehab. I got out, like, five months ago. And what keeps me going is, first of all, the people in here. Like, if I had not cut off all my using friends before I came here, like, I would be nowhere. Like, if it weren't for the people in these rooms and, like, the friends I've made... I would still be using right now. Like, I'd still be doing the same shit that I was doing for the past three years. Like, nothing would have changed. And the other thing is, in rehab, they would always tell me, they'd be like, Ruby, um, out of all the people here, out of, like, all your friends, I guarantee that one or two of you are going to stay sober. And that is incentive for me because in three years, when I go back to the camp and see all the people that work there, I want to be that one. Like, I want to be that one kid that stayed sober out of the bunch. Like, I want that to be me. Like, that's big incentive for me. And how I don't have to hide parents in my drugs. It, wow. Hide drugs in my parents' house. <laughs> Knowing that they're both recovering addicts, I don't have to do sketchy shit anymore. I don't know. It's And it's like I have had a lot of gifts in sobriety, but I've seen some bad shit too. My 15-year-old friend from rehab, one of my best friends, overdosed and died a couple months ago. I've seen a lot of people that I built really good relationships in the rooms go out. Some women tried to come back in, but most of them just stay out. And it's like they were right. They told me in rehab. I was like, bullshit. All of us are going to stay sober. And it's like... I think there's a good, like, four of us that actually stayed sober out of the group. And it's like, I'm still good friends with all of them, but it's hard. Like, I think about every day how, like, I'm never too young to die. Like, person that um, died, like, he was 15 years old, overdosed on meth and heroin two weeks out of rehab. Like, this shit is serious. And um, that's, like, the thing that keeps me going. Like, I was doing shit like he was, and it's, like, I could have easily died multiple times. It's, like, I've done a lot of stupid shit when I was using. I didn't get that much time to fuck up, but when I did, I really fucked up. <laughs> like, I didn't, it did not take that long. And I am grateful that I have parents that are in recovery that as soon as I first got arrested, they were, like... No, they were like, we're not taking any of this shit anymore. It's like they did give me a little time to fuck up, but two different rehabs in a year period. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I am so grateful for the people in these rooms. I'm so grateful for my parents supporting me through this and making it so much easier and that my parents understand what I'm going through and that they've supported me through stealing from them, lying to them, like, leaving the house, or like, just breaking all the rules, outright disrespecting them, lying to them all the time. It's like, I don't know, there's nothing, like, nothing, like, my best friend's death, like, that wasn't enough for me to use. Like, I don't, like, I think about every day that there's nothing that is worth using to me now. Like, there's nothing that is more important to this than me. Like, nobody, nothing is more important to me than this because it's, like, the best thing that's happened in my life. Um, thank you. friends for showing up. Welcome to all the new people. Um, I hope you stick around. This is a 
probably the most entertaining show in town is a, a big AA meeting. You get to watch other people uh, try to straighten their lives out. Some succeed, some fail. But we all keep coming back, which is the key to success. Um, my sobriety date is December 11th, 2004. Um, and I've been trying to think how to how I wanted to share. I mean, I've done this you know, off and on over the years, and I, I get bored telling my own story, so I try to, like, you know, start the, start in the present and go to a flashback and tell me how to <laughs> I, lived in, I got sober in L.A., so everything is like, how can I edit my life to be an interesting storyline? <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll just start when I started using and end for today. So, um, my first drink was at age 12, like Ruby, except I took a little longer to, to get to the, the, the point where I needed to get sober. Um, it was with my friend Tommy Drake in New York when I was growing up, and uh, we, his mother was out, and we went to the liquor cabinet, and we got, grabbed these giant you know, glasses, and we took a shot of everything that he had in there, and it's a splash of coat, and he said, yeah, it's Long Island iced tea. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I had no idea, um, and I we drank. I got about halfway through it, and then I started barfing, and that pretty much explains my drinking career. Um, <laughs> which actually also explains why I moved to drugs. Um, I could never. I actually, you know what? I could never hold any of my drugs or liquor down. It was interesting. I, I barfed on liquor. I barfed on cocaine. I, I barfed on. No, I didn't barf on speed. Um, I, barfed, I, I took uh, those. What would you call them? The the loser. Raver kid, Raver drugs. kid drugs, lame Raver kid drugs. I love, I love those. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I got high, they made, me, they made me want to dance, they made me want to fuck, and that's, <laughs> that's what I liked. So, oh, I forgot. I told my parents about this, and um, my mom and my sister want to get the, the podcast thingy. When I'm like, can we edit that part out? <laughs> I need to, like, censor it for them a little bit. Um, anyway, um, you know, I didn't do anything abnormal in high school. I, I, I drank here and there. You know, we uh, got some, one of us ended up finding a way to buy the drug, no, I'm sorry, buy beer, and we would, like, go to the woods and just sit around and pretend we were badass kids and we were really just nerdy dorks um, trying to act cool. And um, that's all I did in high school. I mean, I even went to Russia and... 88 for a uh, school organized. There was like about a dozen kids and some parents, and we all went. And um, I got offered weed and all kinds of stuff when I was there. I was still communist too, and I was scared as shit to like step outside the lines over there because they said that you know, they, said, they said like you know the KGB is keeping an eye on you because you're American. And this is like the end of the Cold War. The ball was Berlin ball was still up. There was still you know Gorbachev was in office, and um, I got offered weed to get in the car, go to this party, and smoke weed. And I was too scared to do it. That's the kind of kid I was. I was like. I looked both ways before crossing the street. It kind of sums up my... I was, I was the good kid. I was the middle kid, you know? And um, But uh, anyway, I went off to college, and I started smoking weed and found uh, acid, which blew my mind, especially being in upstate New York where everybody's like deadheads. Um, and for about two and a half years, I just did I did that nonstop almost every weekend. And, you know, I, I did so much acid, like, my spine was hurting. <laughs> Well, they said it, like, it messes with your spinal fluid or something like that, but um, I just remember, like, after six hours, laying in bed going, make it stop, make it stop. Make it stop. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and then I met somebody who, when I was 20 years old, I met this, uh, I had just come out of the closet, surprise, <laughs> and uh, I, met this, I met someone at my, at a nightclub in this town when I was going to school in, in Binghamton, New York, and we familiar with upstate. Yeah. Um, the one of the two gay bars there at the time, and um, yeah, we just we just met and I went separate ways. And I, I was I was up there during the summer between school years and working at a hotel restaurant. He gave me walk around the corner. He was like some new waiter there, and I was like a busboy. And anyway, we ended up exchanging numbers and going on a date and um, started dating. I ended up being with this person for twelve years. Um, so from twenty to thirty two, I was with this person and. When I met him, he had just five years sober. He was going to meetings, um, and you know, he was the I, you know, for everybody who doesn't have to deal with coming out of the closet, who's you know, hetero and it's not an issue, you know, got to remember, I didn't have practice in high school dating. It was not something that was happening 
especially in the 80s. It is more so now for kids that early, but so I didn't know what it was like to have a crush on somebody, to have them be interested back and all that. So as soon as someone, so the first person turned their head to me, I'm like, marry me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's not legal yet. But, um, so literally after six months of dating him, he asked me to move to Dallas with him because that's where he was from. And of course, end of my junior year in college, I'm like, yeah. And... Um, <laughs> so I moved to Dallas, uh, changed majors, did everything I could to change myself to be more interested in him. I enrolled in school down there, to architecture school. And uh, things were fine for you know a few years. I went to school, got my degree, started working. And then for his 30th birthday, so this is like five years in, he was like, I want to do ecstasy. I haven't done it in a long time. And it's my 30th, and I want to have fun. And I, my idea of AA was like, if you... I didn't think it was like medicine. I didn't think it was like something you needed to plug into on a regular basis. I thought it was if you had a craving and needed to drink, you went to a meeting, otherwise you were cool. <laughs> uh, which is funny because my grandfather was in AA uh, back in the 50s, 40s, 50s. I mean, he was like one of the early ones in AA. He, um, there's a rehab in the Chesapeake Bay called Father Martin's Ashley House. And Father Martin actually spoke at my grandfather's funeral. Because uh, he worked for Father Martin, and my, I think my he went there to that rehab. Uh, my aunt Patricia went there. My cousin Bobby went there. So I think we have like a wing devoted to our family. <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't go there actually, because when they did my intervention, I ended up in California instead of uh, Maryland, which I'm kind of grateful for. Um, anyway, uh, five years in, he wanted to ask to see. I was like, awesome! I've never done it before. Let's do it. And, um, <laughs> I, I never felt so good in my life. Um, yeah, I was still drinking all the time. Yeah, Peter, Peter, oh God, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, honey. Sorry, um, Jonathan was the guy's name, and he didn't care if I drank. He was he didn't care if I drank, but it turns out he was a pretty much a sociopath anyway. He was lying from day one, and manipulating me. It's it's hard to explain. With, with, I don't want to deviate on all that, but he was basically a manipulator, and I was a codependent, insecure. Uh, blossoming addict, and after he started, after he wanted to do drugs, and I agreed, it just was it went on from there. Um, but before that, we, we used to like to go out. We, you know, I was we were upstate New York, and we'd drive into the city, and he'd like feed me drinks all night long and get me drunk, and you know, he lived vicariously through me. He wasn't exactly the healthiest sober guy that apparently. <laughs> I didn't realize that at the time. I'm just like, awesome, he's getting drunk. Um, but I would like, I remember one time we were in New York and we got a room and I blacked out and he disappeared for a couple hours. Like, you know, if I was had any wits about me, I would have kind of put two and two together at that point and not wasted 12 years. But um, anyway, we started down this downward spiral and then um, we would ended up going to bathhouses on the weekends and partying and dancing and fucking and just doing, you know, whatever. And, um, he couldn't keep a job. He ended up getting arrested by the FBI because apparently he cheated. He used his ex's credit card in New York. And when we moved to New York, he was actually like running away from charges. Uh, and they found him and brought him back to New York. So I was in Texas by myself living with his mother when he was back in prison and in jail in New York for a few months. And anyway, you'd think, you know, red flag, red flag, red flag. <laughs> so fucking stupid. I couldn't believe it, but I, I, I saw what I wanted to see. So that's what it is. And, and that's that's kind of my whole life, actually, is I see what I want to see. And, you know, at least until I got sober. Um, gradually, the ecstasy and the GHB and the uh, pot and uh, what else was there? GBL, if anybody ever tried that. That was fucking awesome for a minute. But it was for a minute. Um, all these designer drugs were all over the place and then eventually crystal just made its way into the picture and that's all anybody had and that's all I ended up doing because that's all anybody fucking had and um, I couldn't get anything else and it was just annoying and I was like, fine and I ended up you know losing 100 pounds losing about four teeth and staying up all night and killing my dog accidentally because she would lift the up off the floor when we spilled it uh, I lost two jobs got fired I had sex in my office after hours with people while I was cheating on my husband because I you know I mean, tie, I mean, sex, and that was the only place I had to go where he wasn't there. Um, he died, uh, age 37. He, he got arrested several times. I sold my 401k that I had at the time to bail him out. And 
He came out of jail in time with like a sore on his shoulder and turned out it was a staph infection and he was like trying to, he thought it was in a boil, was trying to pop it and oh. it, sorry. <laughs> Just you, YouTube it, it's beautiful. Um, it ruptured under his skin and got into his bloodstream and he ended up getting staphylococcal pneumonia and went to the hospital um, and was on... In the medically induced coma and on life support, um, so that his body could heal. And eventually he healed, he woke up, um, but he had permanent lung damage and he had congestive heart failure as a result. And a year later, he died of heart failure. Um, and all that's because of drugs. You know, you probably know meth heads gets, you know, get a lot of staph infections, and it's just how it started. So now everybody dies of an overdose or suicide or anything like that. Some people have slow, agonizing deaths, and he was one of them. Um, that wasn't enough to get me to stop. I actually wanted to obliterate myself after that happened because right before he died, my, the dog died. Um, the week after he died is when I got fired from one of his jobs. And while I was staying, while I was out of town at his parents' house for the funeral, my house got robbed and all the, anything of value got stolen. So it was kind of like this, hi, here's your bottom, and just shoving your face in the dirt and scrapping it <laughs> over and over and over again. It was just like one thing after the other after the other. And by the time everything was done, I was like, fuck. So I did what I could to get as much drugs as I could, and basically from, he died in July of 2004, and from July to November, I just did what I could to obliterate myself and do as much as I could. And I would try to stop using drugs, I would go to 7-Eleven to buy a 12-pack of beer or a bottle of vodka, and that's what I would do until I couldn't take any more. Then I'd go and buy more drugs, and um, before I'd scam myself into getting more drugs, I would get some money from somebody, buy a half a pound of meth, sell three quarters of sell three of the fourths of the pound and I keep a quarter for myself. And, you know, I had all these, like, schemes to, like, get free drugs. And I was so fucking tired and exhausted and hungry and broke. And somehow, I remember I had two moments of clarity right before I got sober. One, it's Halloween weekend, and I was out, I don't know, doing something important at four in the morning. <laughs> and I remember driving back, and... Up the street from the apartment building I lived in, there was a, an intersection, and in the intersection there was this guy, buck naked, running around in circles under the street, <laughs> under the street light. And it sounds kind of funny, but it was a really haunting image, and I was just like, wow, he's really fucked up. And you know, meanwhile, I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, but that image always saved my head. I'm like, oh my god, I never want to be that guy. Um, and, um,. And then another day, probably a couple days after that, I was getting out of the shower, and I looked up, saw myself in the mirror, and I saw, I could see my ribs. And I was like, oh my god, help me. And I don't know if everybody had, I hear a lot of speakers in AA, and, and uh, CMA is a big part of my uh, sobriety, because in LA, the Christian Meth Anonymous is a huge fellowship down there, and there's some over here in the East Bay, if anybody's interested. Um, I, uh, lost my hair part. Um, uh, yeah, I heard a lot of speakers say you know, they had the moment where they see themselves when they say something, and they, they just kind of have this minor moment of surrender where you say, God help me, and, and that was kind of the turning point. Um, a week later, I managed to find a job. Um, like I said, I went to architecture school, and I had, done, I had some, some success at that, but I managed to get a part-time contract position because that's what I was capable of. Um, and I went to the, my first day on the job, and I was so broke, I... I was going to come home for work, for lunch. So I drove home for lunch, and I went to open the door, and I hit something. And I was like, this is in Texas, mind you, in Dallas, where I lived at the time. And I opened the door, and there's, the door hit my brother. My brother, who lives in Philadelphia. And there's my sister, who lives in D.C. And there's my parents, who live in Delaware. And there's the guy in the suit, who, down the road, was going to be on a show intervention. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> and there's a, a, a using friend of mine sitting in the bed looking at me like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. <laughs> and, I'm like, and all of a sudden they all pull out these letters. And I'm like, oh god. And of course, I'm like looking around for the pot and drugs paraphernalia. Like, oh shit, did they see anything? Of course they saw it all. Um, they were there for an intervention. You know, my parents came down for my partner's funeral and they, they kind of saw me and were like, well, something's wrong with him. Then my sister came down, uh, we had a garage sale after he died to kind of 
unload a lot of tweaker shit we had in the house, and um, <laughs> obviously the house was torn apart, the kitchen was completely gutted. We were like, I was a, I was like a, a guy that liked to have sex on drugs, surrounded by a bunch of people that liked to do like projects, and like... <laughs> so if anybody's done math, you know that there's there's project tweakers, there's skin pickers, and there's the, the sex freaks. <laughs> <laughs> Around myself, which was the other two, so it was really annoying, but <laughs> for one of those reasons, anyway. Um, so the intervention happened, and basically, I, I've never really knew about interventions and what they were. I thought it was really confronting you about your problem, but it's not. It's everybody telling you how your addiction and your problems have affected their lives, and they basically lay out what their life has in it because you use drugs. And my mother laid it out for me, and I cried like a baby. And then my dad laid it out for me, he started crying, and I started crying some more. Then my brother laid it out for me, and he started crying, and I started crying. And then by the time I came to my sister, I couldn't even hear anymore. And uh, I actually stepped outside. <laughs> the door rang, the doorbell rang, and I opened the door, and it's the guy I used to buy drugs from during my intervention. And he's like, have you seen... Joe or somebody, I'm like, uh, there's kind of an intervention. He's like, oh, sorry, sorry. He's like, here's 20 bucks. He's like, Joe, Joe is. I'm like, um, yeah, he's someone's his house. He's like, Thanks. And he like, walks off. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> just an odd little commercial break in my intervention. <laughs> anyway, I step outside, and my friend Eric, who was there with me, um, comes out there with me, and so I can smoke a cigarette and freak out. And he's like, you should go. And I'm like, um, well, I'm not an addict. It was like, <laughs> I knew, seriously, I didn't, I didn't think I, I didn't think I had a problem. I could stop. I stopped for two days before to get my job and clear my head. Um, you know, meanwhile, my tooth is cracking as I, you know, speak. Um, so I got on a plane that night and I was headed to LA and um, I was in a, there's a, Ken Seely, the guy that did my intervention, had a sober living house out there that I, I stayed in and it was a, uh, it saved my life. It was a, it wasn't a rehab, like a locked door rehab. It wasn't a sober living where you just had to stay sober and, you know, you could live your life there. It was a very structured kind of a recovery home. And the requirements were, I'm meeting every day, excuse me, um, I had to come back with three phone numbers and I had to put them in the log and I had to call those numbers the next day and write down when I called them and what time, whether I had a conversation or whether I left a voicemail. Um, we did, there's this game, this computer game that Deepak Chopra developed called the Wild Divine, and you put these sensors on your fingers, and it basically, it's kind of like a, I don't know, exper experiential game where you kind of guide through this, like, it's like mist, and everybody remembers mist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 42, it's like, that was the hot game when I was young. <laughs> But you had you, in order to go to the next st stage, you had to do these breathing exercises that monitored your heart rate, and it kind of like caught. Basically, the whole theory behind this place I went to got sober was that um, there was a physical reaction to having a craving that your body that you could kind of work towards controlling to help with your cravings. It wasn't like proposing stuff as a solution to addiction, but it was like you know the theory was your when you have a craving, your capillaries constriction, your fingertips get pulled. So I we did these finger warming exercises where we had to like try to raise the temperature of our hands, and we did these breathing exercises to kind of slow our heart rate down, and it, it helped a lot. And we did we required required to do an hour of meditation in the morning and an hour in the evening as a group. Um, and I did that for. 30 days, and I decided to stay in California because I had started making friends, and I broke down in tears one night thanking, just saying thank you out loud because I, after my first meeting, I didn't have any money. I was there for, I was there for, my parents had to like shove some money in my pocket as we went out the door so I could actually have food because this place didn't feed you. Um, uh, after my first meeting, this guy who I'd never met was like, let's go, let's all go eat. And I was like, I didn't want to go upset any money. And he was like, don't worry about it. And I'd never had anybody buy me a meal in ever, actually. Um, it was IHOP, it was nothing special, but 
I never experienced generosity like that. Like he just paid for my meal and let me eat. And I went to another meeting and it was a round robin format. And um, I still remember it was uh, in, in LA, the West Hollywood Recovery Center, which is across the street from Log Cabin, which I think of it as LA. Those are like the two sober hubs in that part of town. Um, it's like 40 people there. I was about two thirds of the way around the circle and people started sharing. And it was like, Oh, I feel less than. Oh, I cracked my teeth. Oh, I've been arrested. Oh, and there's like every part of my story was told as the people went around the room, which took the five or six, you know, two or three minutes. And by the time it got to me, I was like, I started crying again. I'm a crier, apparently. <laughs> and I finally felt like I people, there's people that got it, that I that knew what I had been through because they just told exactly what happened in my life up until it got to me. And uh, three people gave me their numbers right afterwards, and of course, being the good soldier that I was in the house, I called them the next day. Um, but I had never felt more connected in my life. I had been this lonely, desperate, codependent, drug addicted, insecure mess for years who had gotten his ass beaten by the person he thought he loved and got arrested three times, sold drugs in the bathhouse, chased drag queens down the street with a stun gun. <laughs> Yeah. Her name was Angel. She's like real tall, black, and blonde wig, but she looked like RuPaul. But um, I, pull, I, pull, I, pull, I had a gun for a while. I pulled a gun on these people that come to my house because they weren't supposed to be there. Um, you know, sorry, mom. <laughs> I keep forgetting that gonna, she's going to hear this if I send her the link. So, okay. it's all right. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I flew back to Dallas to get my stuff, and I went back to this Mexican restaurant where I worked for a little while and just like, see some people and had a margarita. And I got about halfway through, I was like, huh, "Probably shouldn't have done that." <laughs> so my original sobriety date was November eighth. I changed it to December eleventh because it was a month later, and I drank the margarita, and you know, I don't think I even got tipsy off of it. But to be honest, that's what I did. I resented the fact that I had to do that, cause, <laughs> but I did for like two, for like three months. I was like. <laughs> alcohol wasn't my big drug. It was, it was, you know, that's why I, I, I always just say alcohol in meetings because alcohol wasn't my problem. Crystal wasn't my problem. Coke wasn't my problem. My problem was up in between my ears. My solution was all of those things. And my solution worked for a long time. And then it didn't work anymore. My solution stopped working. And that's why I was sputtering along because I couldn't get high anymore. If I drank, I'd throw up. If I tried to manipulate or tried to blame, uh, nobody was buying it anymore. So all my little solutions stopped working and I needed a new way. And I was so tired of scamming and lying and cheating and trying, searching for money, trying to make deals. I had, you know, my friend and I, the abusing friend who was in the room for intervention, he and I had a, an eBay scam where we would like post video games on eBay, accept the money, the buy now money, and then close our account. And like we like make money doing that. And get to the ATM before they busted us and get some cash. And um, you know, it was fucked up. I had a Home Depot scam where I would like put fake barcodes on the material, on the checkout on the materials at Home Depot, and I would carry them to the self checkout line and scan like a two dollar thing when it was actually a forty dollar thing, and then I would go back to Home Depot and get the new strip it off and return it for forty dollars and you know I had all kinds of crazy little ways to make money and uh, you know, except for getting a job but um, so when I was in LA and got sober and realized I wanted to stay I moved out there and I just started my life you know I I did ninety and ninety as best as I could I got a job in my field for making less than I had but it was still in my field and getting I just got back in the horse career wise. Um, and just start doing do you know my first sponsor walked me through the first three steps and he was new at this he was only like a year ahead of me in sobriety and had never had a sponsee so he wasn't sure how to work the steps I didn't have any clue and um but so we got the NA workbook if anybody's done the NA steps the NA workbook's a lot of fucking questions I mean, it's like step one here's a hundred questions that you have to answer us like, god damn so we did that we went through it and you know the first three were you know they're all just about, you know, making sure you understand where you are and where you have, that you have a problem and um, that you are not the end-all, be-all to the world. And I remember, I never really had a problem with the whole God thing, I, but I remember somebody put it this way. They said, okay, well, 
How was how was how was rising the sun this morning? Did you have any hard hard time getting the sun in the sky? <laughs> like, what do you mean? They're like, well, did you you're in control, right? So you raised the sun, and I'm like, okay, I get it. Fine. <laughs> yes, I didn't pause the time. I get it. Um, so there's obviously something bigger than me. I don't. I just say God because I haven't figured it all out yet. I don't know if I ever will. Um, a lot of people have a problem with the whole God thing. Um, to me, it just means that I'm not in control. You know, I make my own decisions. That got me into rehab. So, you know, my decisions got me into the gutter. And my decisions got me arrested. And my decisions made me have to seek help. And I got help. Um, after the first three steps, my sponsor kind of faded away. He, he ended up relapsing and going out and drinking. And I, uh, I switched sponsors, and he worked with me the fourth and fifth step. And that was kind of enlightening, you know. Uh, Four step was really hard for me. I would write one thing down and throw the notebook across the room. <laughs> because I hated thinking about that shit. I, was, I would get pissed and I would get upset. And I just was like, it was tough. Like, I, it took me like six, seven, eight months to get it done just to, so I would refuse to do the writing. I would write one little thing or think about writing one little thing and like, you know, go do something else that I could distract myself with. But when I did it, I did the fifth step with him and read it all. He pointed out some things that I had no clue were going on in the background. Like he's like, "Oh, common thread here, 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 here." here. I was like, huh. yeah, "Okay." <laughs> I just had no idea, and it, it helped to read out the four columns to him and have him kind of point out some things that I hadn't seen. And it was kind of mind opening. So if you're if you're stuck on the first step or, or in the middle of doing it for a step, I encourage you to just, just even if it's not as thorough as you would like, which mine was not, just get it to a point where you can do your fifth step with your sponsor because it will open your eyes. You can always do another one, and, I'm, um, and another, and another. <laughs> and uh, I ended up switching sponsors again because there was some gay drama around him, and I just got tired of it. <laughs> There's this uh, sober thing in Palm Springs every fall called and dry. It's the LA, the gay LA AA group goes out there and has a convention basically, and um, it's kind of like you know, Mean Girls summer camp. It's really <laughs> <laughs> but no, but it, it, it does. It, 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 I'm doing it in disservice, actually. It's, a, it, it's an amazing experience on a lot of levels. The meetings are fantastic. The people you meet are amazing. But there's a lot of like stupid little gossipy things that happen. And, and this one thing, I heard that my sponsor was talking shit about me. I was like, okay, I'm not going to see him anymore. I'm just going to find a new sponsor. And um, I was at a meeting downtown LA at long, my lunch break at the Y downtown and I shared about that. And this guy came up to me after the meeting and says, do you have somebody in mind who you want to be your sponsor? And I said, yeah, I do, actually. I just have to ask him. He goes, well, why don't you call him? I'm like, okay, I will. He goes, no, no, no. Take your, take your phone out. And he stood there. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, call him. And I'm like, all right, I'll call him. And I, I got on the phone. I called. And I kind of like did this and, and left a message. I turned around and the guy was gone. Um, and, but it, he was the impetus to get me to do it. And I still know who he is. I don't know what he looked like. didn't know his name. That meeting, I went to occasionally when I could in my work schedule to catch a meeting if I knew I was going to, you know, for, just to check in in the middle of work week. And um, that sponsor was was with me for, oh, excuse me, Kirby, um, <laughs> until I moved here. So, and I'm never, I've never been the best at contacting sponsors. I'm really bad at calling. I'm sorry. Um, my current one is in order now. And, we're supposed to get together tomorrow to do some work, so yay. But I've always been I've always been bad about doing it. I don't know why. It's a suppressed uh, resentment against authority kind of thing. I haven't identified it because I don't see them as authority figures, but I think subconsciously there's something there that makes me put them in that position. Um, but okay. my sponsor now is very cool. I adore him and his wife, and I'm really happy to be part of this fellowship. You know, I moved up here a year and a half ago. I got laid off from my job in LA and came up here with my partner now. And we've got a house, and we're just making things happen again. And it's interesting relocating after being sober in one spot all your, all my, all my program. I've had to kind of reset my thinking back to when I was new again, and like reach out and meet people and get numbers. And I've been really sucky at it because I mean I know about a dozen people in this room, but I've been here a year and a half. When I was in LA a year and a half, I knew like hundreds of people. So um, 
but I was also wasn't working and was in rehab and made to go to meetings every day. So <laughs> here I'm working hard and getting to about two meetings a week. But um, you know, there's a lot of familiar faces. I don't know a lot of people here yet still, but the ones I do, I really like a lot. I'm grateful to that everybody's opened their hearts to me. And, um, you know, I got about a minute left or so, and I would just urge everybody to work the steps, stay in touch, come back. Even if you fuck up, just come back. There's no reason to not come back. You know, it's we're not a cult. We're not here for anything but ourselves. We're not, you know what I mean? Like, we're here to stay sober, and we stay sober by helping you. We stay sober by listening to you. We stay sober by working with you. So if you don't show up, we get into trouble, and we end up faltering. So we need you here. I need you here because, you know, my mind starts drifting. I go to less and less meetings occasionally when I get busy or, you know, think I'm getting busy, and I don't think about using, I mean, I've got almost 10 years, I don't think about using or drinking, but the old way of thinking starts coming in, like, I don't have to do that, I'm good, I'm fine, I can handle this, and I start getting a little wonky, I start getting a little manic, and I start thinking things that lead me down the road to get towards relapse, and thanks to the program, I'm aware of what those thoughts are. That's what I got put in my toolkit, is the awareness of that's the wrong way to go. This is the way I need to go. You know, that path may look pretty and cute and fun, but there's a black hole at the end that, you know, whereas this one keeps going. And I'm just so grateful to have my life. I'm so grateful to have the man I have in my life today who's got 30 years sober. Um, so he'll probably end up being a speaker here eventually. Um, <laughs> um, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.